what makes a really good PD is someone who is capable of being a jack of all trades, that you do know a little bit about everything. I think in um, theater in general, um, it's very important that the technical director um, accomplishes the the, does, the designs that are given to him or her, <laughs> and uh, that they make sure everyone is safe. And, and it's a lot about the environment that is um, created for the performers and the director and creating an environment and a mindset where the people who are relying on you to do things that are outside of their realm of understanding feel comfortable in knowing that they will be accomplished at the deadline that they need to be accomplished at. Uh, well, the main job of the technical director in an academic setting is, uh, especially at Amherst College, is to uh, promote safety as well as uh, teach some technical skill in set construction. Um, my job is also to make sure that I maintain uh, timelines. In an educational world, I think that the TD um, is responsible for the safety and the soundness of the design in a, in a larger way. I think that the I think the TD in it in an educational world needs to do a lot of it's in the, the the relationship that develops between the performers and the director and the stage manager and the TD is becomes controlled by how that TD invests in the art that they do and where where the art is. I mean, when you boil it down to, it just comes down to, well, at Amsha, it comes down to uh, building the set. Um, uh, I think the technical director's job is to uh, basically make the vision of the set designer and, uh, to a lesser extent, the other designers, make their artistic vision come true as, close as, as closely as possible to what they had intended. Well, first one is uh, definitely time management. You know, you gotta be able to schedule stuff effectively. Make, uh, yeah, just, you know, figure out the schedule, plan things out. Time management, first of all. A big piece is learning how to schedule and how to plan a calendar so that, and, and again, like I figure out how long I think it's gonna take to build and then I double it. <laughs> and I still like, eh, I don't know. Double, <laughs> and sometimes even that's still too shy. Because I think one of the biggest, hardest things for me to learn was how to run a crew. And, um, and it, and it's, and it, there's a lot of finesse in, in how to. And I think that I still get, um, I still there, I still, I'm still learning and tweaking. How to run crews. Um, you know, when I was starting to run crews, I was like, I'm a TD, you have to listen to what I'm saying. Um, and that, you know, of course backfires. <laughs> and, uh, and how to, because I think, I think that you have to inspire your crew. And that's a huge part of, because, especially for technicians who are the invisible artists, they have to feel invested in what they're doing, or they're not. Or you're not going to get what you need, which is an incredible amount of dedication. And so, part of your job, or part of something that I think is, you have to learn how to get in there and run and inspire crew, but keep a crew moving. Um, do enough teaching so that your crew can continue to grow. Um, but not so much teaching that you don't move your set along. You know, that it's a real um, fine tune. And then in a, if you're working with a professional crew as a TD, you need to learn how to understand and assess what are each person's skills. You know, who works well together, who doesn't work well together. You know, if you have 
these types of projects that you need to take care of, who's your welder? You know, if this person is your better welder, but this person has a better work ethic, right? Do you teach the work ethic person how to weld? You know, or how do you create and design a crew so that you can most efficiently get your work done? And I think a lot of the crew appreciation comes down through the PD. Getting, uh, getting people organized at the right times, you know, having uh, everyone, you know, it's one thing to plan out a schedule, it's another thing to find people that, you know, can work with it and will show up at the right times. It's managing people is the hardest part, because they run lot, they have their own lives to live, stuff doesn't, stuff can just stay there and follow your rules. You just gotta talk to a lot of people when you're scheduling at the beginning. Then we make sure you have like a, a core group of people that you can uh, count on, that you can kind of, well, I guess it, may, it sounds kind of bad to say the way, but you can guilt them into showing up a little bit, make them like, sign them up early and get them to say like, yeah, I'll help you. And then later on, when you're making the schedule, you can kind of build the schedule around them, knowing that you'll have at least a few core people that will be there when you need them. And then, uh, you can, then that way, once you know you have a few people, the rest of the people, Getting a large group of helpers isn't as important because you know you have at least a few. If you can figure out how to inspire a crew, you will never have trouble finding a crew. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's important for people to grow in a theater ensemble and the reason I chose to work in educational theater rather than, re rather than regional theater is it distressed me as a theater professional to hear technicians refer to the actors as talent um, or as tools or you know in the, the schism that happens. Um, and then to also hear designers refer to the builders, you know, as, you know, the term, the term that one designer used for us was thick ankled, meaning we weren't artists, we wouldn't take care that he wanted them to hire specific sculptors because the designer didn't feel that the carpenters would take enough care sculpting the work on his set. Um, and, to, and to be a part of that schism of who's creating art and who has the most investment in the art um, distressed me. And I think I, I maybe erase all that. Maybe the most important thing is an ability to think outside the box as a TD to say, you know, how am I going to solve this particular problem? And that problem can be, you know, a, a myriad of things. It can be personal, it can be engineering, it can be tool fixing, it can be you know, I, I have a material and I need to make it do something else. How do I redefine, how do I have enough flexibility in my mind to redefine what I think the solution is and see that it's not working and be prepared to drop it and try something else. Um, and then ultimately you have to learn how to organize yourself enough so that you can have that process happen and not miss your deadline. Again, that you have to have your deadline in mind as a TD. I, I think that the the thing that uh, I've just uh, has helped me most as a technical director is uh, trying not to be confined by the kind of more typical, like, you know, there are typical ways of doing things and building certain things, and they're not always necessarily the best way, whether it's because of the resources you have or the aesthetic that you're looking for. So just... Um, Basically, uh, having a wide base of knowledge in the basics of a lot of different types of fabrication so that you can then choose which works best for what you're doing and, uh, you know, not getting stuck with one idea. And they also need to be the person who lets the designer know that this is an unrealistic expectation for the amount of money that I have to spend to build this set. Uh, a lot of times you're going to be working with set designers who will have uh, some pretty high expectations of what you can get done and not necessarily, uh, whether whether it's because they don't have the practical knowledge or because of, for, for whatever reason they uh, expect you to be able to do uh, maybe a lot more than you feel you can do, but 
if, if you push through it, you can really surprise yourself and get a lot of a lot of really cool stuff done if you just kind of, you know, if you don't worry about this is an unfair expectation, you just do it. I think that as a PD, you need to figure out how to disinvest your ego um, so that when everyone else's egos are coming down and, you know, this play, you know, my idea is not going to work. You know, my vision is not going to come through. My blah, blah, blah is not going to happen. Right? As a TD, you need to be disinvested from the ego of it enough so that you can make someone else's vision happen. Right? And that that's where you are in our